Good evening. My name is Selena Joffrey, and I'm the Director of Business and Policy at Asia Society Texas Center. This evening's webcast is on the topic of Your Voice and Your Vote, Elevating Asian American Civic Engagement. The topic is especially relevant in advance of the general election this year and what can be done to foster an identity that encourages higher Asian American engagement and voter turnout, especially amid the ongoing pandemic. Our speakers this evening are Christine Chen, who is the founding executive director of APIA Vote. During her tenure, she has expanded APIA Vote's partners into 28 states. Mark Jones is the fellow in political science at the Baker Institute and a professor in the Department of Political Science at Rice University. His research focuses on the effect of electoral laws and other political institutions on governance, representation, and voting. Mustafa Tamiz is the founder and president of Outreach Strategists. He has been an advisor for many successful campaigns for state legislators, mayors, members of Congress, and public institutions. Our moderator is Andrew Schneider. He heads Houston Public Media's coverage of national, state, and local elections. Following the conversation, we'll be taking some questions. So please share your questions throughout the discussion via the Facebook and YouTube comment box. Thank you. All right. Welcome, and uh, we're going to get started this evening with a question for our entire panel. This is one of the major political de developments of the campaign and certainly the biggest political development of this week. Tuesday, former Vice President Joe Biden named Senator Kamala Harris as his running mate, making her the first African-American woman as well as the first Asian-American to be named to a major party ticket in the United States. Uh, I'm going to ask this question to the entire panel. Uh, what is the political significance of this event for the Asian American and Pacific Islander community? And uh, why don't we start with Christine Chen? Good evening. Thank you for um, inviting me for this conversation. You know, um, especially Texas is being a key component of what we're seeing in this 2020 election. Um, you know, this historic, this moment of Kamala Harris being um, uh, brought onto this presidential ticket is really historic. It's um, it's really generating a lot of interest and enthusiasm among Asian American voters, um, in particularly the South Asian um, community, um, but also just because of uh, her ability to really talk about the influence of her mother, the story about um, growing up uh, with immigrant um, parents has really resonated already within 24, 48 hours. Um, we've already seen a lot of discussion from the community. A num number of folks still didn't even realize that she was Asian American. Um, so, and we also know that anytime um, Asian American candidates run for office, that does increase the voter turnout in a particular area. And now that this is a um, election on the presidential level, uh, we expect this is going to be able to help us be able to motivate and turn out um, additional Asian American and Pacific Islander um, voters as well. Okay. Uh, Mustafa Tamiz. Well, I, I agree with Christine. It, it, it is very significant across the country, but especially here in Texas. Uh, Texas has the third largest Asian American population. But what makes this population unique other than California and, and New York is that South Asians are in plurality, meaning that there are more South Asians than East Asians in Texas versus California and, and New York. So over a million Asian Americans here having a plurality with South Asians. Uh, and, and the other part that I think is not often spoken about that you know, the suburbs of America are changing, especially here in Texas. And if you look in those suburban populations, half, almost 54% of Asian Americans live in those suburbs. So it is uh, a, a very important pick uh, for this country. Uh, and it's also very significant uh, for the turnout amongst Asian Americans here in Texas. Okay, Mark Jones. 
Oh, thanks. Well, I'm not going to repeat what both Mustafa and Christine said, which I agree with. I will highlight uh, two things. One is along the lines of what Mustafa said, uh, Kamala Harris's selection could be very pivotal in some key races here in Texas. Uh, Congressional District 22, which is primarily Fort Bend County and a little bit of Harris County and Brazoria County. And then two uh, Texas House districts. Uh, that would be uh, 26 and 28, uh, which are down in Fort Bend County, which have large Indian American populations, where stronger than usual turnout and Democratic voting by Indian Americans could help Texas Democrats take control of the Texas House, which th then would give them a seat at the redistricting table in 2021. I think another thing that, that's important with Kamala Harris's nomination, and I think why, one of the reasons why Joe Biden selected her is the gravitas behind her and her political resume. Uh, that is, Joe Biden will be 78 years old when he assumes office. Ronald Reagan, who up until now was the oldest president, was 77 when he left office. Uh, there's a realistic probability that Joe Biden does not want run for re-election in 2024. And there's also a non-trivial uh, probability that it doesn't make it to the end of his first term. And therefore, it was incumbent upon him to select somebody who the Americans could view as easily stepping in as president of the United States. I think with Kamala Harris, he selected that type of candidate. Okay. Now, it's important to recognize that the Asian uh, and uh, Asian American and Pacific Islander community is not a monolith and political opinions within the broader community have not historically demonstrated a definitive trend one way or the other. Uh, so again, for, for all the panelists, uh, do you think that this has had any impact on outreach efforts from any of the political parties? Let's stay with, with, the, with Mark for this one. Uh, well, it certainly does mean that when you're engaging in outreach, it's not as simple as engaging in outreach to African Americans or to Latinos, which even though you have diversity within the Latino community, the language is shared. And uh, an overwhelming majority of Latinos in the United States are, have Mexican heritage. So it's not as diverse. Whereas when you're dealing uh, with the Asian American population, dealing with very distinct cultures, very distinct levels of income, education. And I think that requires, I think, a more tailored and nuanced outreach approach that targets each individual group, uh, perhaps with uh, some, some similarities in the message, but also with differences. I think we've seen in Congressional District 22, uh, the Democrat candidate Sri Kulkarni has been very effective in recognizing this nuance and using it effectively to reach out to groups with a similar message, but not necessarily the identical mes message, and also in the, the respective languages that are used by that community, not trying to say reach out in just one language. Okay, Christine? Well, you know, even though culturally the Asian American and Pacific Islander community is quite diverse, but when you are talking about values and issues, they um, tend to vote in a similar similar way. Um, in addition, um, the Democratic Party has actually been making headway in terms of um, gaining more favorability since 2000. Uh, there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, part of it is because you've seen a growth of Asian American Pacific Islander candidates running for office, and the majority of them are coming more from the Democratic Party. And as noted earlier, that when you have more candidates, they tend to reach out to their own base and introduce them um, to their, that particular party that they belong to. Um, according to uh, our polling, um, API vote as well as um, API data, we conduct national polling once every two years. Um, and what we've seen is that, you know, the Democratic Party nowadays actually have a two to one advantage, but ultimately it does come down to your relationship with that particular candidate um, and making sure that it really is about a long-term engagement. Okay, Mustafa? You know, uh, competitive elections are won and lost on the margins. And so candidates that are good at reaching out to diverse communities uh, that can speak authentically to them are likely to succeed and do well. Um, we talked about Sri Kulkarni in the 22nd Congressional District. Uh, you know, it, there are over 100 plus languages that are spoken across that district. Um, he is at an advantage of, of, of reaching out of those people, not just because he's Asian Americans, but you know, he's a career foreign service officer. So he has a, a sense of, he has an ability to engage those voters, uh, engage them uh, even outside of the Asian American community. So I think what we're gonna see as, as politics evolve in our, in our nation 
as we become more and more diverse, that candidates that can authentically talk to people, uh, can engage them in issues that they care about, can address their values and bring them into the political sphere are gonna be at advantage. Um, and then at the same time, we're also seeing more identity politics played now than ever before President Trump uh, has really alienated a lot of people that have come uh, to this nation as immigrants uh, with his rhetoric. So while we see a coming together uh, in the Democratic Party, uh, we've also seen identity politics played in the Republican side uh, that long-term will be damaging to the Republican Party. Christine, as the founding director of APIA Vote, could you tell us a little more about your initial work with the organization and how has APIA Vote's mission or programming evolved over the last few years? Right, so API Vote, we're a um, nonpartisan nonprofit organization focusing on reaching out to other nonprofits in over 28 states currently. Uh, we're really focusing on building their capacity and um, so that way they could uh, conduct voter registration and get out the vote activities. Um, for our community, the idea of conducting voter registration and voter participation work is fairly new to them and foreign um, because for the longest time, a lot of our nonprofits thought that um, that's a political thing, that you're not allowed to do that. Um, so it actually has taken time when we first started um, in 2007, a lot of the conversations were just even um, talking to the leadership and making them understand that they're allowed to do this work. Um, so it's been really exciting, especially this last decade that we've been able to really increase the number of organizations participating in this. Um, so they all are conducting their own voter registration um, work. Um, right now, especially with the pandemic, um, they've, they've been learning what they've um, in terms of their work with census, they're pivoting um, those lessons learned to their work for the elections. Um, also, we've been able to understand that we can only uh, be part of the narrative when we also have data about the community. And that's why we invested in conducting in-language polling every two years. So that way there's a clear understanding about this electorate and what, they, what the priorities and communities that would motivate them to come out and vote. Um, in addition, I think it's really exciting that our youth campaigns have really been able to increase in size and interest. Um, the youth vote among the API community has traditionally uh, been very slow in terms of registering and, and participating. But since 2018, we saw that they tripled their participation since the 2014 elections. Thanks. Um Mark, uh, although it's estimated that Asian Americans will constitute nearly 10% of eligible voters by 2036, civic engagement among Asian Americans still remain stagnantly low. Given your experience, what are some of the reasons behind the lack of participation among minority communities? Well, really, when we're talking about minority participation, uh, there's it's helpful to contrast African Americans who participate at a very high rate. It's not that much lower than Anglos, especially when you control for other factors. Uh, and Hispanics and Asian Americans who participate at a significantly lower rate. Uh, first off, one thing that's always important when we're looking at raw numbers is roughly one out of every four Asian American and Latino in Texas, as well as at the national level, is not a citizen. And therefore, uh, those that are over 18, and therefore they cannot vote. For some, though, they have the ability to obtain citizenship, they just haven't started the process yet. So they could be essentially citizens, but they haven't started the citizenship process. The second is that even among citizens, uh, voter registration rates among both Asian Americans and Latinos remain quite low, generally oscillating between 50 and 55, 60% uh, in, the, in the United States and Texas compared to in the low 70s and high, for Anglos and high 60s for African Americans. A lot of that has to do with engagement, mobilization, uh, as well as education. And but part of it is also having candidates that reach out to these voters and groups that reach out to these voters uh, to essentially explain to them the importance of voting and then make sure they get to the polls. Uh, and so the more that happens, I think we're going to see Asian Americans like Latinos 
essentially begin to punch at their weight level. Right now, Asian Americans are effectively punching below their weight level in terms of their impact at the polls. Am I back? Yes, you're back. Yep. Oh, sorry about that. I dropped oh. off a minute. My connection, my connection dropped off. I apologize. Um, Mustafa, you yes. recently recently talked about polling models and hidden voters in election 2020. Could you talk a little bit more about why people are concerned about hidden voters and how Asian and API voter engagement may fit into this picture? Well, one of the things that's happening is that the, the makeup uh, of the electric is changing. We saw that with President Trump. We saw a, a, a large percentage of rural voters come out uh, that had not participated in elections before. So when people or polling, as, as Mark will tell you, you, have, you base your uh, assumptions uh, on prior election cycles. So you have to kind of say what percentage of voters are, what does the makeup of the, of the voting pool looks like? And so we saw a lot of, not necessarily errors in polling, but the polls that have missed their mark because they didn't anticipate such a significant uh, turnout from rural voters. I think in this coming election, we're seeing a lot of changes in what the makeup of the electorate looks like, uh, not just from Asian Americans in emerging demographics like that, as Mark said, there's more, more uh, people that have become citizens recently that are registering to vote that have not been accounted for before. But you're also seeing things like, um, you know, younger voters. I mean, I think this election cycle, we have a potential of, uh, you know, baby boomers and Generation X surpassing the number of, of, uh, of baby boomers in the electorate pool. So, I think there's a there's a young pool of voters that are coming in, and it, it's a very fluid cycle. And on top of all of that, uh, the pandemic, uh, you know, with with the changes in our, in our voting system, potentially more mail ballot. Many of the the voters that had not uh, participated on mail ballots program before, uh, so there's just so much fluidity in our electorate that polls and and polling uh, is becoming more and more difficult. You understand the opinions of people but you don't necessarily understand exactly who's going to vote on election day. And, th and that, that I take it is, is how you're defining a hidden voter. Yeah, and I think that, uh, I, I think that there, there, there are a lot of people that talk about President Trump has got these hidden voters uh, and that you know they, they never poll because they're too embarrassed to say that they support him. There's all sorts of those things. But I think the important part is that this is probably the most consequential election in our lifetime. I think everybody would say that on both sides of the aisle. Uh, and it's incumbent on all of us uh, to do everything that we can. And that's why I value our, our co-panelist, Christine, who does so much in terms of uh, you know, her organizations and even her civic work uh, outside of her organization in, in communicating with Asian Americans, putting out the importance of voting and being engaged in the political process and a lot of that work that's happened in the last, I think about 25 years is really coming together in this election cycle. Okay. Also, you know, I just wanna weigh in that I think voters in, including the Asian American Pacific Islander electorate is highly motivated. Um, I think in previous cycles, there was a question of like, oh gosh, we have to go through the cycle of uh, motivating individuals and then getting them registered. They are highly motivated, especially um, experiencing the last six months, when you see that there's been a rise of anti-Asian um, sentiment and, and violence um, in terms of how the pandemic is being handled. Um, also, when they compare it to relatives that they know in Asia. Um, and then also a number of them have been really getting involved with uh, Black Lives Matter movements and uh, racial equity um, uh, issues. And so it's really a combination. So now it really is about educating the electorate about the process of early vote and um, what are the different options because it really does vary from state to state. Yeah, yeah. Christine, you actually anticipated my next question there. Oh. I was gonna, I was gonna ask you that, you know, with regards to the, the significant increase that we've seen in, in xenophobia and anti-Asian sentiment throughout the pandemic, do you see this as having an impact on the API political participation in the election fall. It is definitely an issue that uh, resonates with the community um, because ever since they've been hearing about, um, you know, the, the xenophobic, 
xenophobia being increased um, because of the terms like Chinese virus or Wuhan flu or Kung Fu flu, you know, that really does stigmatize individuals of Asian ethnicity, which then results in racial profiling and attacks on Asian Americans here in the United States. Um, but then it also perpetuates this whole idea of how we're constantly being seen as a foreigner. And that's something that we've been battling with and um, it's been really impacting um, our lives. And so this is a constant issue that we've also seen um, come out in the polling, not even before the 2020 elections. Um, it actually has shown up in other polling um, that we've done in previous years as well. Mark, this is uh, switching gears a bit, moving down from the uh, from the national polling level to the local level. Um, Houston's a very diverse city, and you talked in particular about how Latinx and Asian American residents are inadequately represented on our city council. We currently have a, a, a city council with, with, with no Asian Americans uh, on it. Um, what can we do to make sure Houston City Council is more representative of our diverse population? Well, I mean, yeah, so the principal liabilities or limitations right now is uh, only having, having significant underrepresentation of Latinos and no representation of Asian Americans, where we had a long streak where we always had at least one Asian American on council, and for a short period, too, ranging from uh, Martha Wong to Gordon Kwan to Steve Lee. Uh, now we have none. It's, it's tough to use electoral rules to get that to get too much, but one way is to get right now we have a mixture of single member districts and at large districts. Uh, one, one method to ensure greater minority representation, particularly among Latinos, it would be a little tougher for Asian Americans is to move to a complete single member district system like Austin has recently adopted, which therefore allows you to, con to construct geographic districts that better represent specific groups. And it would be possible, at least in the Houston area, to take District F, which is, cur is currently the district with the largest share of Asian Americans, and boost it up a little bit, where you wouldn't guarantee an Asian American victory, but you would guarantee that Asian Americans have a good ability to elect a candidate of their choice. Uh, but we also have problems in the state legislature as well. Right now, we only have three Asian Americans in this, uh, the state legislature, two Democrats, uh, Hubert Vo and Gene Wu from here in Houston and then one Republican, Angie Chin Button from up in Dallas. Uh, of those three, Angie Chin Button is facing a very competitive election this cycle, uh, Vo and Wu are safe. Uh, and there's only one potential replacement for her if she loses, and that would be J.C. Chetan out in Fort Bend County, who was a Republican who narrowly won his runoff with the support of Greg Abbott and will face off against Sarah de Marchant, uh, which was an unfortunate race for Asian American representation in the sense that um, Democrats had a great candidate, Suleiman Lalani, in that race, but he lost the runoff, uh, which that would have guaranteed uh, Asian American representing that district. But even the best case scenario, we'll have four Asian Americans in the state house, none in the state Senate, and probably one Asian American in the uh, congressional delegation, Gene Ortiz Jones, which still is much uh, far below the state population, which is roughly 6% Asian American. Right. Mustafa, uh, I. Outreach Strategist works with a, a myriad of organizations that operate on a local, national, and international scale. How can different types of institutions and companies support and encourage employees that want to exercise their right to vote, especially during this global pandemic? Well, I think it's it, it, it's just engaging people in meaningful conversations, and I think that's I think that's just incumbent on our part. I mean, recently. Um, the, the uh, Charles Foster who's on the board of Asia Society uh, has been leading an effort uh, to create a monument, mo monument for President Johnson. And what I found really interesting about it is if you look at the donor base of that, um, you know, large part of it is Asian Americans who are just civically involved and engaged in it. And so they see the President Johnson's uh, uh, support of a sweeping uh, immigration legislation in 1965 that really allowed people like my parents and others to come to this country. And so Asian Americans are involved in a lot of different ways. And I think we have to uh, begin to talk about the, the civic involvement, civic engagement beyond just voting, because I think that uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of folks that are involved in different ways and, and voting has just become part of it. And I think that in the coming decade, what you're gonna see, as Mark said earlier, 
that we, we, we're not punching above our weight, but I think in voting, you're gonna start seeing just like in other sectors that Asian Americans begin to punch above their weight. We see that in political contributions. We see that in civic involvement. Uh, we see that in some educational trends, and I, you're probably going to see it on the voting that Asian Americans will turn out to be one of the highest propensity voters over the course of the next decade. And, you know, what we've also seen in other states is that uh, when the community population has grown and there's more organizations um, doing voter engagement work, then as a result it, um, that you know, there's more individuals getting exposed to the process of voting, uh, running campaigns. The, um, and then later on, many of them we've seen um, get start to get involved with boards and commissions. Um, and so that's actually does lead to a trajectory where you can actually create a pipeline for those that will ultimately run for office. We saw that with um, in Michigan, Stephanie Chang, she was um, she actually created API Vote Michigan as a nonprofit was exposed to um, campaigning, and then she was tapped to be considered to run for state representative um, in Michigan. She won that election. Then she thought, okay, that's it. I'm not going to do that. But then she was then tapped to um, be encouraged to run for state Senate, and she won that race. And since then, she's been able to motivate a number of other younger folks to also run for office as well. Great. Um, Christine, you, you've also worked with Strategic Alliances USA, the Organization of Chinese Americans, the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights, numerous other organizations. What does civic engagement within the AAPI community look like today compared to when you started working in this space? Yes, you know, when I first started here in Washington, D.C. in the 90s, there were essentially just four national Asian American civil rights organizations, um, OCA, Japanese American Citizens League, Asian Pacific American Labor Alliance, and now what's called Asian American Advancing Justice. Um, but now there's over like 35 national Asian American and Pacific Islander organizations that do public policy work. A number of them have grassroots organizations uh, across the country and as well as um, in different territories. So um, and in addition, we have also seen um, a growing number of congressional members. So now we have the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus. Uh, during the um, President Clinton's years, he helped establish the White House Initiative on Asian American Pacific Islanders. And that has been um, carried on um, for all the different administrations, regardless of political parties. And so as, as a result, we've seen a growing number of APIs on the Hill, working in the federal government, in the administration, but then also as a... Um, impact of that, we've also are seeing commissions that are specifically for um, Asian Americans, like governor's commissions on AAPIs, as well as at the city level. So, you know, we're, we're seeing a lot more engagement and the community has also become a lot more diverse. It used to be um, mostly just East Asian, like Chinese and Japanese when I first started. But now when you look at the uh, beautiful coalition that we have at the national and local level, it, it's very quite diverse. And what barriers to voting still exist for these communities? I mean, the reality is that our community is still um, too, close to two thirds uh, first generation immigrants. So it's always about um, making sure that we have a process to educate and making sure that they understand what is the process and the importance of voting and how that actually does impact their lives on a day to day basis. Um, once again, I think right now, um, with what everyone's experiencing there and you know, there's a a great way to connect up like what they're experiencing now. And they're seeing how local decisions that are being made at the local level, state level, and the federal level by our elected officials are impacting their lives. Andrew, I'll add one more thing to what Christine sure. said. Uh, Asian Americans make up a, 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 a large percentage of our healthcare workers. And so when you see whether they're physicians, whether they're working in other support fields, whether they're nurses, uh, we have a fairly large population. So people are starting to understand that public policy affects their life in, in a meaningful way. So whether it's the opening of the schools or whether it's the frontline healthcare workers, uh, the community's impacted and they're understanding that their vote really matters. And as we start seeing the suburbs become a major conversation 
whether in, in Texas, we're, we're doing the Sri Kankani race right here. Uh, 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 you know, last cycle we saw uh, Judge K.P. George, who, who uh, you know, unseated a, a long-term incumbent uh, to take over Fort Bend County. We're seeing that the empowerment is, is real and people can see when they get together, when their candidates run, they actually win races and success builds on success. And so I think the coming decade is gonna be very exciting for the Asian American community, not just in, it, in its empowerment, but it, how it, it weaves in the social fabric of American voters. Okay. Mark, since beginning your work at, at Rice University, how has voter engagement among minority communities changed in Houston? And what are organizations here doing specifically to reach out to AAPI and other minority communities to get them involved? Well, I mean, these groups have been active for quite some time. Uh, we had a student here at Rice named Ben Cho, who was very active at the vote and was, and was a delegate to the Democratic National Convention. So we, uh, I think what we've seen is the organizations have grown in scope and number. I think as Mustafa said as well, uh, the election of Donald Trump has changed things for a lot of people in terms of the sense of urgency, the sense of motivation, the realization that elections have consequences. All of this has had a pretty dramatic effect on Latino and Asian American voters in the Houston, Houston area. And it's resulted in greater mo uh, registration, people becoming citizens that ha hadn't before. Once becoming citizens, they've registered to vote and then they're turning out to vote and they're voting Democratic. I mean, there's a reason why I often say that Donald Trump is the worst thing that's happened to the Texas Republican Party in the modern era in that uh, he's both galvanized uh, and given us a reason to mo mobilize to many democratic oriented groups. And he's also helped peel away many Asian Americans who for fiscal reasons or other reasons tended to vote Republican in the past to get to the point where Christine uh, mentioned where right now we're looking at more or less a two to one vote uh, advantage for Democrats, which wasn't always the case, especially in the days when communism was a, a motivating factor for many Vietnamese Americans and Chinese Americans. Uh, what we're seeing is that with President Trump in office, he's effectively done much of the mobilization work uh, for these groups and has helped them essentially, as I think as Christine mentioned, there isn't the need anymore to convince people of the importance because they're seeing it on a daily basis. So anyone in the Indian American community who had a friend, relative, or coworker who received h one who had, was on an H-1B visa now knows what the consequences of policy are. And you can repeat those across the spectrum, whether it's on the U.S.-Mexico border, whether it's on DACA, whether it's on DAPA, uh, all of that's given a mobilizational tool that previously was there, but was sort of, was essentially un, was latent, not uh, uh, over. Well, Mark said, well, Mark said, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, a question for all of you. I'd like to, since since Mustafa, you're the last person to, to speak, we'll start with you. Um, given concerns surrounding the coronavirus pandemic and the subsequent increase in voices against absentee voting, how can we help to ensure that minority groups like the Asian AAPI community still feel safe and supported in casting their vote? Well, look, I mean, I, I think it's, you know, I, I'm very conscious of how I say things because a lot of times they sound very partisan. I'm a I'm partisan. When I say these things, sometimes they sound partisan. But the president, you know, uh, reducing funds, changing policies at the post office to impact uh, mail ballots is a real thing, right? And, um, you know, the pandemic has been a, a very uh, traumatic thing for, for our society as a whole. And so... Uh, we're asking to go out and, and have people vote and take their lives in their own hands. And if they vote by, if you encourage people to vote by mail, the, the post office has been slowed down. I think Governor Abbott has done a very important thing by making early voting a little bit longer. He's created a number of days, and I think that's a very important step. Uh, and, I, and I really think that we should, um, you know, make voting easier for all people. Um, I don't think that this move by, by the Republicans across the country in making voting uh, more difficult, it's really going to work out for them in the end because it, like Christine said and, and, and Marco said, it galvanizes people, right? I mean, it's like elections have consequences and when people try to prevent you from voting, 
it actually gets people more engaged. Uh, so this is not the benefit of the Republican Party by doing this. And at the same time, uh, it causes confusion uh, more than anything else. So I'm hoping that uh, the, the better angels in us uh, rise and that we make voting easier for people. And from a community standpoint, I mean, we have a lot of, uh, you know, what's not talked about a lot, many of the people impacted by the coronavirus uh, are healthcare workers, which are within the Asian American community. Mark? Yeah, I mean, I think it, with voting, I think there are a couple of things to keep in mind. One is Mustafa mentioned, Governor Abbott has extended the early voting period. And election officials throughout the Houston and Texas area are doing their best to make sure that the environment's safe. If anyone's going shopping in a grocery store or going to a family gathering or a pharmacy, voting in person will be as safe as that. But for those who've been engaged in uh, serious quarantining or don't want to risk their life or that of a, a loved one, they also have an option, according to the Texas Supreme Court, which has said very clearly that if you feel that voting in person would adversely affect your health, then on the mail ballot application, you simply check disability. No one in the election administration is going to investigate to see if that's true or not. They're simply going to mail you a ballot. Now, you should. I think it is prudent to try to do that application sooner rather than later and to mail your ballot in sooner rather than later. But that option exists. The problem is I think there is confusion about it is that because of the conflicting messages, most people aren't aware that all they need to do is check disability if they're under 65. If they're 65 and older, it's no excuse absentee voting. They don't need to do anything. But I'm, I'm reasonably confident that at least in the Houston metro area, our election officials will be able to handle this and will be able to have uh, safe voting and everyone who wants to exercise the right of suffrage will be able to do so either via voting in person or voting by mail. Okay, Christine. For APAP vote, we recognize that there's a lot of confusion um, in terms of what the process is. And once again, it is state by state. It, it really does vary. So we're investing um, in um, making sure that we reach about a minimum half a million households um, who are low propensity voters and first time voters to mail them a translated piece of, um, in their language to really explain the process um, of their options, whether it's early voting or if it's absentee voting. Um, the beauty is that for, at least with the Asian American community, when they were polled back in 2018, um, I would say about, it was 44% had noted back then that they were, they were planning on voting early or via absentee. And so that was before a pandemic. So I think um, but that means I really need to educate 60% in terms of what the process may be. Um, and so I think a lot more of our community is planning on taking advantage of that, especially when you look at the trends of, of Asian American voters in California, Oregon, Washington, how um, over 50% um, typically go take advantage of the mail-in ballots. Okay. Well, on, on that note, we actually have a, uh, uh, a, an audience question on this, um, which perhaps you could elaborate further, Christine, or, or the other panel members. How would November mail-in voting proposals specifically affect Asian American voters? I'm sorry, can, can you repeat that again? Sure. It's a question from Paul. Uh, how would November mail-in voting proposals specifically request Asian Amer uh, specifically affect Asian American voters? Well, let me let me let me jump in there. I, I think that there uh, you are trying to engage new voters, uh, many of them for the first time, on a new way way of voting uh, on on the mail ballot. Uh, as Christine and Mark both said, what what really changes uh, is this confusion that's occurring. So whether it's messaging on coronavirus or, or messaging on on voting, we've just seen a lot of mixed signals come from from the president, from uh, our federal leaders, as well as in our state leaders. Uh, and that's why, look, I, I, I'm a Democrat. I credit uh, Governor Abbott for making it a little bit longer time to for people to be able to vote during early vote season. But he has to show the same leadership on the mail ballot, that he has to begin to really, through the Secretary of State, spend the kind of resources to create enough of an education. It shouldn't be on the one hand that you can vote by mail by checking a box. On the other hand, uh, others in, 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 the, in state government saying that they're looking for fraud, right? Because it, it makes people second guess their decision on voting. And, and we just should, 
that in American culture, we should not have anybody trying to prevent others from voting. It's just not, it's just not the American creed. Okay. Um, this is a question specifically for Christine uh, from SEMA. Has your polling shown a generational difference in political leaning amongst Asian Americans? Um, in terms of political leanings, I would say it's been mostly uh, within the Vietnamese community um, where the Vietnamese older generation um, tend to be a little bit more conservative and the younger generation be a lot more progressive in terms of their leanings. Um, but also what we've seen is that that has changed quite a bit throughout the years. Um, so there is a little bit more mo movement um, even among Vietnamese older um, voters where they are uh, starting to turn toward the Democratic Party and the candidates and supporting them a little bit more than they used to in the past, like such as like in the 90s. So we're looking forward that um, in about two or three weeks, we'll be releasing new data on our 2020 polling. So we hope to have a lot more information for this election cycle. And as a, a follow up to that, um, we have a question from Judy is whether voting is also aligned upon generational affiliation. If voting is voting is also aligned upon general generational affiliations. I'm I'm sorry I couldn't hear. It. Maybe Mustafa, if you want. Yeah, you so hear I, I, I think yes. I, I think look, uh, you know, you, you pass on a lot of traditions uh, in your family, right? I mean, you pass on your faith. Sometimes you pass on your political affiliations, uh, and so. You know, uh, if your parents are Republicans, you might rebel and want to be a Democrat and, or, or vice versa. You may grow up to be a Republican. So I think it has an impact. What we're seeing is that Asian Americans, uh, their values impact the neighborhoods and communities they live in. But also their the culture also affects them. So as younger voters are more and more uh, trending towards Democratic Party, young Asian Americans automatically are also trending towards Democratic Party because their identities, not just Asian Americans, but they're also millennials. Right. So. There is that there is that sense that uh, the country is headed in a, in a particular direction, and Asian Americans are, are going to be part of that. Right, and a, a danger for that for the Republican Party is that we often refer to that as the age of say 17, 16 to 25 as the age of mass crystallization, where you develop your partisan leanings that aren't fixed in stone, but are those that begin to that you carry through your life and only change with some reluctance. And with President Trump in office, what's happened is many Asian Americans in that age group are being, and this also applies to Latinos, are being crystallized as very vibrant Democrats, in part because in opposition to President Trump and many of his policies. And a related note, we've got another a, a generational question. This one from Sarah. She's asking, uh, a lot of young people in the Asian American communities are enthusiastic about coming together and organizing but how do they reach across generations if there's a language barrier? You know, uh, once again, it's, you know, we're, we're noticing that uh, people are moving back to home. So it really does go back to assume that 50% of your family and friends are not registered and not in, in the past did not vote. Because when you look at that national data, you could go ahead and make that assumption. So we're asking every um, individual especially the younger generation that is highly motivated to have those conversations with your parents. Um, but it, it also is about talking about the issues, the values that they care about, um, connecting the dots in terms of what is the current conversation like, what, what concerns them, and connecting that dot to the power of their vote and the importance of them voting. And then making sure that since you're there with them to go ahead, pick up that laptop and, um, or, you know, get that voter registration form and go ahead and take them through that process. I think there's a beauty of, in, in some ways that in this pandemic that we are coming together or we're also having conversations with people that we haven't had in a long time. And this is an opportunity to use your relationships to go ahead and get others engaged that haven't been. Okay. Anyone else? I, I, look, I, I'll, I'll just say this, that I think that uh, there is a culture change that's occurring uh, because of the pandemic, with the way we live, the way we work, the way we go to school, uh, the way we interact with each other and in our families. And so part of that is, is you know, what we, can we have more meaningful conversations with each other? 
And one of those meaningful conversations is, as Mark said earlier, elections have impacts. And so uh, uh, they have real consequences. And we should talk about that and, and get people to vote, not just because I'm saying so, but to understand that that's part of our civic obligation as Americans. We've got a couple of questions about the census. Um, Judy asks, do any of the panelists have any comments or research on APIA, uh, uh, um, I'm sorry, it says, it says APIA uh, participation in regards to the census, which is another critical part of civic engagement. And May asks, uh, is there a risk of undercounting Asian Americans in the census due to the pandemic? Yes, Christine, take, take it away. So the, the last that we've seen is that, um, you know, Asian Americans are doing fairly well, but we are lagging behind in some of the larger cities, which include Houston, Chicago, New York, Los Angeles, and those areas. And we know that there's a large immigrant population in those cities. Um, so once again, we're, you should assume that the people who are tuning in today you most likely have completed the, the census. What we need to do is dig deep into our um, list of phone numbers, those who you text, those that you have not text. Think about who's most likely are having difficulty that you haven't engaged in, that are typically not civically engaged, and to have those conservative um, conversations. And the reality is that we don't have that much time. And when you have less than 50 or 60% of the population that has not, uh, that have only um, completed their census, that means 40% are not being counted. That means 40% is not going to get the resources for your city. And that really impacts the quality of life for everyone in the community. And I would say that, you know, it's especially, I think, crucial for Asian Americans because one of the methods that the U.S. Census Bureau uses when it's trying to deal with low response rates is interpolation based on neighborhood characteristics. But since Asian Americans don't tend to live in as concentrated groups, they're more likely to lose out than say Latinos or African Americans who live, tend to live in more homogenous neighborhoods. So it's an especially crucial for Asian Americans, especially to, to get counted as individuals and individual family units to make sure that they fill out the, the census. Uh, we are running short on time, though. I think the Trump administration is probably going to close it earlier than we would have otherwise liked. And that can have negative consequences both for communities, but also for cities, counties, school districts, and states. So it's really important on, for everyone to do everything possible to encourage the entire population, citizen or non-citizen, to fill out the census form. And I think that's one of the unfortunate things that's occurred this cycle is that you have many people who are non-citizens or who have non-citizens living in the household becoming a little reluctant to fill out the census form out of fear that it could somehow come back to haunt them, even though it will not legally. But still, there all it takes is a little bit of fear, and the rational thing to do is throw the form in the trash or uh, delete the text message. Yeah. And, and, and if it, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, regionally, like Harris County, uh, Fort Bend County, the city of Houston, have really done a lot to try to reach out to the hard to reach population and communicate in multiple languages, encouraging people to fill out the census. I think uh, community organizations have done a lot to get out there and tell people to do. But as much as we've done, there's so much more to do. And as this deadline moons, I think we all have to, you know, re-energize our efforts because as Mark just said, you know, the President Trump's almost taken a month away. It's, uh, the numerators are not going to be out there as long as they were supposed to. So. The, the federal government, both in the post office, uh, both in, in the census, as well as just in overall voting, is pulling back and making pe making it more difficult. Uh, this can have long-term impacts in, in many different ways. So uh, as, as you look at your life, as you look at people in your life, you know, reach out to people about census because that's going to have more impact to your kids' education. It's going to have more impact on healthcare and on communities. Uh, and this is something that uh, affects all of us in a, in a very significant way in Harris County. And, you know, it's really as simple as incorporating this into your daily life. Um, so I would take advantage that here you, you just went through an hour long conversation watching this. So when you, um, next time when you see someone or you're texting them, you could talk about like, 
hey, do you know that the census you know, is still open, that we should be able to like, um, you know, complete it for your household? Or do you know that census impacts, you know, the amount of money that we get for healthcare? Like inter intertwine it into your everyday conversation. It's the same way with um, voter registration. The reality is like right now, most of our nonprofits and our volunteers are talking about both at the same time. Alice has a, a, a social media question. Um, last presidential election, WeChat was used widely by Chinese American voters. With the potential banning of WeChat, what will that will that have a major impact? Yeah, so WeChat is is something that um, the Chinese community we have seen them grow um, in larger amounts in terms of using that as a communications. Um, I, I think the, the fact that there is a threat of banning that, um, I think the the Republicans, you know, candidates really need to look at that, whether or not um, if, is, is that going to be really beneficial to them? Because already the reaction that we've been hearing from the Chinese community is that, well, this is like a, a reason, a major reason for them to even vote for the other candidate, even just for the fact that they so much rely on that tool to be able to talk to their own families um, back in China and elsewhere, and even here in this, in this community. Um, the, also, the reality is that this cycle, uh, when we're approaching different um, Asian populations and um, communicating with them, we have to not only be on WeChat, but what's all, um, WhatsApp. Um, for the younger generation, it's also about Snapchat and Instagram, right? There's so many different uh, ways. Um, that you know, we should also just in case take a look at what are the, the other tools that we may have to utilize to be able to communicate with the Chinese um, population. In, in addition, locally, though, the Chinese consulate in Houston was closed uh, uh, by the president. So th this, you know, you, you we can uh, debate and argue, uh, talk about you, you know what is the impact of the Chinese economy, what all sorts of things, but just the tone that the president's taken on these issues. Uh, it affects people at an emotional level, and and it's it's a shame to me because you know as Democrats I think we are the beneficiary of that tone that more people are are trending towards Democrats, especially in the Asian American community. But as an American, I just think it's a shame that 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 we are better than this, and he's brought us to a level that um, you know pitted one uh, he's really pitted a lot of us against each other and. and I think that 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 legacy from him uh, is going to have to be healed in, in future administrations. Okay, I think we've got time for just about one more question. Um, uh, we've got a question from Syed, uh, specifically from Mustafa, but also says, and anyone else. Uh, the younger generation of Asian Americans are very active in politics to the older generation are at least bothered to vote or even registered to vote. How can the younger generation mobilize them? You know, look, uh, you know, uh, young activists also always feel like the, the older generation is just not engaged. Um, you know, I, I, I sometimes don't see the number and math in that because I actually look at voter files and I see who votes. Uh, just like all, you know, just like all voters, the older you are, the more likely you are to vote. Right, the younger you are, the less likely you vote. That doesn't really change amongst Asian Americans or any uh, any other ethnic group. Uh, what really is inspiring to me is in, in the protests, in the activism, uh, you know, that we've seen young people take on the streets. And I'm hoping that that uh, act, sense of activism also leads to voting in November. Uh, but beyond that, uh, there is a big generational divide. I think this election, as I said earlier, we're likely to see. Uh, millennials and Generation X outvote baby boomers. So there's a generational shift that's occurring in our country. And, and, I, and I'm hopeful that young Asian Americans that are active, that are activists, that are working in political campaigns, um, you know, emerge as, as real leaders, not just within the community, but broadly. All right. Yeah, I have to, I have to agree with Musafa that the numbers really don't add up. Um, so you really need to uh, realize that we need to make sure that you go ahead and talk to your own base of friends who are the, the younger generation. And like I said, you should assume that half, at least half of them, if not more, are, are not registered and voting. 
Mark looks like he wants to say something. Yeah, okay. well, I, I agree. Well, Mark. The numbers are pretty. The numbers are pretty clear. Only about a little more than half of Asian Americans who are eligible to be registered to vote are registered to vote. So there's still a considerable amount of work to do. Those numbers have improved over the past four years, but they still are far away from where Anglo's and African Americans are. So there's there's still is quite a bit of work to do, and that has to be done within the community by friends, families. Uh, reminding people to, to actually register to vote, and in some cases, helping them do it because it's not a uncomplicated process for people who are not politically aware and active. Okay. Well, on that note, I want to thank uh, Christine Shen, Mark Jones, and Mustafa Tamiz. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Please tune in again next Thursday, August 20th at 7.30 p.m. Central for a conversation with Ambassador Kishore Mabubani. Ambassador Mobobani is a veteran diplomat and author of eight books. He is currently a distinguished fellow at the Asia Research Institute, National University of Singapore. He has also served as the president of the UN Security Council. Ambassador Mobobani will join Asia Society to discuss the U.S.-China relationship and the strengths, weaknesses, and eccentricities of the two superpowers. Learn more about upcoming webcasts through the Asia Society website. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.